You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now, Sam Hankin. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. I started the store back in 2005, and it's been nothing but a joy to me uh, as an independent bookstore. And what made it even better this year is that we were voted best bookstore in Philadelphia, and somewhat more arcanely as the best non-corporate coffee shop on the main line. I don't know what that means, but it's good for the store because people come in and say, what does that mean? And then, <laughs> then they're inside the store. Uh, so any, anyway, today we're lucky enough to have with us Azar Nafisi, the critically acclaimed author of Reading Lolita in Tehran, a book so well known that I need not even go further. All of my listeners have already read it. Azar is a fellow at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. She's taught at Oxford as well as several universities in Tehran. Her latest book, which will be published tomorrow by Viking, is The Republic of Imagination, America in Three Books. And luckily also for all of us, she will appearing at the, be appearing at the Free Library downtown, the library founded by Benjamin Franklin, on this Thursday, the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. The Republic of Imagination is a book about America, as well as another land, that some of us know intimately, some of us are acquaintances of, and with a preposition, some of us are vaguely aware of, and some of us who find that America distasteful. And the cool thing about America, unlike Iran at times and other countries, is that we can all hold these views without fear of prosecution or condemnation. Informing, of, informing us of this republic is a czar channeling Huckleberry Finn, Babbitt, and The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, with a touch of James Baldwin, as our Virgil through the gates of America into a world of imagination. Welcome, Azar, and thanks for joining us today. Um, thank you. I have to congratulate you, and I hope one day I will have some non-corporate coffee. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I think it means not Starbucks, but I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's so cool that I get to talk to you the day before the book is published, and I get to plug your talk and signing at the library this Thursday at 7.30. Yeah, and, you know, I have such amazing memories um, from uh, Philadelphia Public Library. I think that both my other books, Reading Lolita in Tehran, things that I've been silent about, that was where I first talked about in, in Philadelphia. And uh, I guess Benjamin Franklin, as its guardian angel, is, you know, helping people fall in love with the library. And, and like you talk about your father, every weekend my father would drive us down to the free library, drop us off, and my brother and I would just stay there all day. It was like being in heaven. <laughs> Um, well, it's, it is really being like being in heaven. Um, those who are planning our education these days don't understand um, about what a world a library or a bookstore is uh, for a young kid. You know, I mean, what treasures they find. And, and I want to talk about that a little bit, too. But the other thing was, I just watched um, your interview with Seth Meyers on Late Night. Oh, yes. And that, <laughs> that was a beautiful necklace you were wearing. <laughs> I love oh, that thank necklace. you. Actually, I, uh, to sort of uh, promote another place that I really love, um, um, which is the, the Smithsonian Museums uh, here in Washington, D.C., I got that necklace from um, the Museum of um, African uh, Museum at um, the Smithsonian. It was, it was really nice. I liked the way it was like a triple la layer. The, col the crimson color of it was beautiful. I really liked it. Thank you. It. Although this is not going to sell any of your books. <laughs> but, no, but I hope it will sell some of the necklaces at that museum. <laughs> it, it was really nice, and it really stood out there. So anyway, so where is this republic? How do I get there? What mode of transportation do I use? All you need um, is to have the alternative eye of imagination. I mean, you know, people think that um, when you talk about Republic of Imagination, it is somewhere uh, far away in the distance. But as we discover through, in fact, re reading some of the best children's books like um, Wizard of Oz or um, Charlotte's Web or Alice in Wonderland, we all need a Republic of Imagination right in our backyard. 
um, because we can't constantly and every minute of our lives leave, uh, live in this routine life. We need to also be able um, to a- imagine because, you know, without imagination, you don't know the world, you know, because you can't be everywhere and know everyone. Uh, but through uh, imagination, you travel to distant lands and you can put yourself in the hearts and minds of so many different people. Well, you know, it sounds like, well, no, you, you actually do say it in the book. The person who first led you to this republic, this land, it seems was your father. And tell us a little bit about how he helped you to, to do yes, this. Yes, it was my father. I, I always tell, I think I also mentioned it in my other books, that in our family, the only thing we were snobbish about was books. I mean, if someone was as interested as we were in books, you know, we almost immediately created a bond. And part of that was because of my family, and especially my father. Um, From very early on, I mean, I think I must have been around three or close to four, um, he made a habit of telling me and later my brother um, bedtime stories. Uh, And then he would read them to us, and then um, when we grew up, just, you know, we were in the first or second grade, he started, um, whenever we were good kids, what he would do, we we would get books as gifts. Uh, so we never thought of reading as a chore. We always felt that reading was sort of a reward. Um, and and um, another thing that I think is important that my father did was that uh, he didn't just talk about the Persian tales that were fantastic, but alongside of Persian fairy tales and mythology, um, he would um, bring to us um, like Pinocchio and Little Prince and uh, um, and actually Charlotte's Web. And so um, from that early on I had this imaginary map of the world in my mind and I had been to all these places without actually physically going there. That's so funny because I was like in your place because I loved Shahrazad and A Thousand and One Arabian Nights (laughs) and I would read one story a night. That is wonderful. And, you know, Shahrazad, I always tell people uh, that, you know, she's the mother of all stories because her whole story is that, uh, you know, when you have a violent ruler uh, that kills everyone, a a new girl every night, um, you don't use the same kind of weapon he uses. Uh, and, and, And through stories, she, in fact, cures the king makes him curious, makes him empathize um, with others, and makes him understand uh, that he can't generalize people. And also Uh, she saves her own life, too. (laughs) Yeah, and she saves her own life. So you always think that the the storytelling in so many different ancient stories, storytelling becomes a way of surviving because um, you mesmerize (laughs) the person by the story you tell, and it gives you a lot of power. It's like magic. It is a type of magic, I think. It is. You know, it's, what we, you th- we just miss it. What do you think would have happened to you in terms of being able to reach this republic if your father had been a different type of person, a tinsmith or a bicycle repairman or a clerk? Do you think he would still... <laughs> I, I have no idea to tell you the truth, but, but you, you, you um, through your bookstore and, and through the kind of person you are, most probably meet a lot of readers. The great thing about reading is most probably the fact that um, uh, it is a very human thing to do. People are curious about stories, and all sorts of th- people from different walks of life uh, want to know th- about stories. Um, I guess one. I guess if you have a parent who really encourages you, um, then there is more guarantee <laughs> that fu- that reading becomes part of your life. It's funny because my father played a big part in this too, and the way he did was there used to be a story a store on Ninth and Market. Um, uh-huh. called Leary's, and each floor was devoted to a different genre, and I love science fiction and oh. fantasy. And we'd go, to, and they wrapped their books in brown paper and string, which I still do, because I think that's the way books should be wrapped. And uh-huh. I, um, he would take us there every Saturday, and we'd go there, and I would end up with a stack of like 13 books, and I'd be very scared, because I'm thinking, how could my father allow me to buy all these books? It's so much money. They were 35 cents for a paperback. <laughs> and um, I would go up to him gingerly, um, 
as you did in, with this fellow in Seattle we can talk about. Um, and, and I'd say, can I get these? He goes, as long, and he wasn't a reader. And he said, as long as you uh-huh. read them all, I'll buy you, you can what, get it. I'll buy you whatever books you want as long as you read them. And then at night, he would come into my room like at 2 o'clock in the morning, and probably like you, I'd be under the sheets with a flashlight reading uh-huh. my books, and he would yell at me, but as he left the room and closed the door, you could see just the beginning of a smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how lovely. I know. He is a lovely person. That is beautiful. You know, and, and, and some people, of course, also, you know, how um, a great teacher sometimes encourages them or, or even their local librarian or bookstore owner, an uncle, an aunt, you know. <laughs> Um, that, that is what I love about um, reading. Uh, um, it is, in a sense, uh, the most uh, democratic act, uh, you know. Um, you don't ask if readers are Republican or Democrats, who did they vote for, <laughs> you know, or, or what class and gender and race or ethnicity or religions they come from, you know. Um, readers are just readers. <laughs> It's so funny because before, when I was preparing for this interview, I was looking up, what is a republic anyway? So I looked up the definition of republic, and then I looked uh-huh. up the definition of democracy, and they uh-huh. were essentially the same thing, maybe slightly different, and maybe that's why we have two parties. But I like the concept of a republic. It seems more all-inclusive for some reason. I don't know why, but it does. Yeah, it does. Of course, uh, as you know, we've also had had uh, terrible republics during the German, um, uh, the, uh, the East Germans also called themselves actually the Democratic Republic, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but um, uh, the point about democracy is that um, the novel is so much the cultural manifestation of the ideal democracy, because um, in a good novel, um, all the characters, including the villain, uh, have a voice. Uh, and, um, you know, usually novels are about individuals and the choices individuals t- take. Uh, so they're also very moral affairs. And uh, that is why I think if we take literature and arts uh, out of our lives, uh, we lose something about our humanity. Well, going back to attempting to sell your books, um, uh-huh. let's tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about the germ of this book and the gentleman who approached you in the book line at Seattle. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, it was really strange experience. Um, uh, I was signing, um, uh, actually, it was reading Lolita in Tehran in this wonderful bookstore in Seattle, Elliott Bay. And uh, uh, this young man was in the line, and he didn't have a book. And when it finally got to him, he told me that, um, you know, he had just uh, arrived recently from Iran and that what I was doing was useless because he said these people don't like to read. <laughs> you know, he said they're not like us who would Xerox 100 pages of Madame Bovary or Hot Finn. And, and that just stayed with me. And, and, and it stayed with me in the sense that I had to ask myself, um, can a democracy exist without a democratic imagination? And um, that was uh, sort of the start of the germ, I mean, the, the seeds uh, for, for, for writing that book, because uh, uh, I felt um, it is ridiculous for us to only uh, love reading uh, because we're deprived. But then at the same uh, time, you do lament, um, which goes a little bit towards his thought process. You do lament the fact that in New York, your beloved bookstores are now Ann Taylor Lofts and 19 independent bookstores. Yeah. So, close. so you, do, you do agree with him to a certain extent, I think. Well, that, that was what I was um, trying to... Uh, at least I hope it will also open a discussion um, uh, around, uh, you know, th- that idea. Uh, what I wanted to say was that 
everything that we as human beings uh, uh, obtain, like, uh, for example, we're talking about books, about like freedom of expression, um, uh, the, the joys that we have from going to museums, um, being free to read and discuss any books we want, all of these things uh, were not um, God-given rights, and they can be taken away from us. Yes. If we do not um, nurture them, if we do not guard them, if we do not fight for them. And, and if a democratic society becomes uh, too complacent, um, then it will lose these things. Um, you know, during the banned book um, week, uh, I was giving a talk at uh, uh, Martin Luther King Library at my city, Washington, D.C., and one of the quotations I, I loved um, and I was telling people about was from Ray Bradbury. He said that you don't need to burn books to destroy a culture. All you have to do is to get people not to read them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, in a democracy, nothing, in, nothing, including what we call in general freedom, uh, is guaranteed. Uh, at every age, um, there are different forms of um, uh, oppression, different forms of anti-democratic mindsets, and there are confrontations. And how we confront these problems, how we solve our crisis, cannot um, come about uh, without ideas, without imagination, without um, knowledge, you know. Well, um, in, a, in a very similar way, but much more... I don't know, secretive is not the right word, but you know, you've know, you embraced the Western canon for whatever reason you have embraced it, uh, in my mind. And then you also, and we talked about it a little bit before we started, about what the curriculum in secondary school is now, and it's not about fiction. And you no. tell us about that and how you feel about it. No, you know, um, well, uh, the, the, the uh, thing with Western canon was the fact that, uh, of course, I love the novel. I mean, I love poetry as well. But um, anyway, um, that, that's beside the point. <laughs> uh, but uh, my major uh, at college was um, uh, English and American Lit. So I've been teaching in, and I've been talking about it. But to tell you the truth, Every country, every nation I think about, I first think of the stories I've read from it. Um, but what has happened in our country, which really worries me now in America, is that um, the system of education in public schools, uh, what is happening, we're denigrating uh, fiction, poetry, arts, music, and people who are suffering uh, are people who really deserve much better, uh, but they might might be um, in a much more uh, poorer uh, condition. Uh, we have private schools, uh, but you have to pay, I don't know, from 20,000 to <laughs> sometimes 40, 50,000 a year for your children to go to private school. Um, and, and I think that uh, uh, our children are being deprived of something very precious. And this will show later on in future generations um, the way we are um, taking away from them uh, the ability to imagine, the ability to be curious about others and, and to empathize and to articulate themselves, to connect to the world. Um, all of this is taken away from them. Uh, and to tell you the truth, one other thing that worries me uh, is that everybody is talking about, both Republicans and Democrats, about um, making our children career ready. And I have no quarrel with that. But you would think that teachers and librarians and bookstore owners and musicians and artists and writers and poets, they are also having a career and that a democratic society should provide uh, for all individuals to choose the career of their choice and not to force them to only go in one way, you well, know? That's true, but in some senses, and I don't want to say it's a Pollyannish sense on your part or an overly optimistic sense, but when you talk to me in the first third of the book about Huck, I mean, I identify mm -hmm. with all of it because I read Huckleberry Finn when I was 12 and then reread it and yeah. resonated with me. Um, yeah. 
but there are people now in school, especially like with Moby Dick. Nobody in school wants to read Moby Dick. No, you're right. You're right. And, and, and we'll pay a price for that. That is what I was um, trying to say, that the fact that if you... First of all, you know, they keep talking about the fact that, um, you know, they're cutting fiction because they want critical thinking, and they bring in what they call informational text. I mean, could somebody explain to me how reading and trying to understand Moby Dick on all these levels doesn't make a person uh, to think more critically? Well, look at our president, if you want to call him that, George W. Bush. Um, he he hasn't read a book in his life, and neither has neither did Sarah Palin. These are our Republicans, and I think he read one book by Louis L'Amour. Except I don't think he really read it. Just like Bill O'Reilly has a new book about who killed Patton. I don't think he wrote a word in the book. But <laughs> these are the people that you're. I don't know how you can reach them because I don't think. They can, well, well, you know, for me, I tell you one thing, uh, the, the, both from my experiences in Iran and my experiences in here, I, uh, of course, among our political elite, there are all sorts of people, some are very open, some are wonderful, and, and some are not. Um, that is not the point. But I feel that I want to reach out to the people. If this country claims uh, that it believes in constitution, I mean, you talked about Sarah Palin or Bill O'Reilly, and they keep talking about the constitution. It would have been much more interesting if people who oppose Sarah Palin and Bill O'Reilly also talked more about constitution and told us how they define that constitution. For me, the constitution begins with we the people. So I'm appealing to... Um, students and parents and teachers and in case of books to readers I'm trying to tell the readers that if the freedom is taken away from good teachers to teach fiction from if booksellers go broke if librarian if libraries are closed you and your children are the ones who are going to suffer so you as readers are also responsible Look, you're preaching to the choir. Do you think I make money at my independent bookstore? (laughs) That that is the point. You see, but but then you become an example, won't you? Because you you are are exactly saying the same thing. You're exactly proving how wrong, for example, I'm saying, Donald Trump is. Yeah, I agree. But the, the problem is with Barnes, well, and I said this on the show last week, so I shouldn't repeat it, but a little boy came into my bookstore. He was 12 years old. And he wanted to buy War and Peace. And he mm-hmm. was 12 years old. And That's wonderful. So, and so I couldn't sell it to him because Why? He, I had to give it to him. I, oh. I, I couldn't make him pay for it because he was 12 years old and he wanted to read it. So I just gave it to him and hopefully it's kind of like one of those pay it forward things. But how could you, how, you wouldn't charge him for it, would you? No, no, that is the whole point. You see, that is, there are two sides to, at, at least I was trying to so, show two sides to this country. I mean, it's partly human nature and not just American. True. But we're talking about America. Um, one is the, the, the Babbitt side, uh, where, uh, you know, everything is money and, 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 and everybody, um, it's a doggy dog world, you know, and, and the people who want something else um, are called all sorts of names, the way they are here. We have job creators, then anybody who says uh, public schools should be um, paid attention to might be called socialists. Huh? But the whole point here um, is that there's another aspect to America, and that is the aspect that I hope you and I would you know, um, push forward. And, and, and that is the part where um, it says that uh, anyone Anyone who has a dream, um, we will give them an opportunity to actualize that dream. That life is not made of money only, um, but money should be used to fulfill people's passions. That your passion, which makes you give that book to that boy for free, is already, I'm sure, planting a seed in that boy's mind. Hopefully. 
I, because, you know, that is how people remember. I bet you 10 years from now, he would be talking to someone about it. That's how he went to this bookstore. And, you know, because he was in love with reading War and Peace, the bookstore owner gave him the book for free. Maybe he will buy a book for another boy who needs it. You know. and, and that is also America, you know. Um, so these people who tell you you're an American because you're criticizing, I suggest they should go and read Mark Twain and James Baldwin. Actually, any great writer, and see how they say, uh, you know, how, how they define um, what it means to be a good citizen. Well, look how you developed your book. I mean, it must have been really torturous for you because originally you had like 26 authors. I know I had 24. Oh, yeah. So and how before you... that, I had much more. I had, uh, I, I, I was going to talk about the whole world. <laughs> well, how did, you, how did you end up coming down to uh, Huckleberry Finn, Babbitt, and The Heart is a Lonely Hunter? How did you, how did you do that? I don't even, I can't even imagine how you did that. Well, well, that is why it took so many years to write. <laughs> you know? But what I did was, I thought that if I talk about 24 or even 12 or 10 books, it would be impossible for me to go deeply into some of the themes that are very important for me. So rather than choosing a lot of books to which I cannot, which I cannot do justice to, I will choose fewer books that would be manifestation of the ideas that I want to talk about. And that is why I started also with Mark Twain. Of course, I really started with Wizard of Oz in the introduction. Right. And I wanted to end with James Baldwin because I, I was talking in this book all the time about how Mark Twain through Huck and Jim left his progenies in the land of fiction, and I felt that James Baldwin was the true uh, heir <laughs> to Huck and Jim. Well, it's like, uh, you know, I, it's to, not to, to use the phrase you bookend it, but you bookended the book really well in terms of, I think, in terms of ending with James Baldwin, but you actually began with an epigraph from Langston Hughes, which... Yes, which, yes. I love that uh, poem. Yeah, and, and, and I realized as I was writing this book, I realized how central, uh, I mean, we all realize how central race has been to the definition of this country, but how, how central um, race has been um, to the development of fiction in this country. Well, look at what you were because saying in Huck Finn about the word that's been redacted from the book that I can't say here on yeah. the air. Um, is it the quote from Alice Waters that you use? Uh, it's the quote from uh, Toni Morrison. Right, from Toni Morrison. Um, and so there's a word that describes Joe in the book that we can't yeah. use in today's parlance. So how do you feel about leaving that in or taking it out? Because I think that touches on a lot of what you're writing about. Well, that, that is what made me so angry. That censorship, I mean, um, uh, that is why we have banned book weeks, because we don't only censor in uh, totalitarian uh, societies. And I felt that if a word is so offensive, there is a reason for it being there. If you're a racist, and there are many still in this country, you would use that word in order to denigrate and shame um, uh, other people. But the way Mark Twain uses it, uh, the way he uses it, is to make you understand that uh, the the horrible part of slavery was not just that people were being shackled and uh, made to work um, in those, under those horrible conditions. It wasn't just physical. The worst thing was trying to take away from the slaves their humanity, um, to, to define them through a derogatory word. That word was the symbol of all the violence um, that had been... Uh, in, uh, you know, uh, inflicted uh, uh, upon uh, the African Americans. And that is why it's so potent. And our children have to understand that we cannot protect our children from the violence that has happened in the past or from the violence that is happening right now. The only thing we can do with our children is through fiction, through history, 
make them understand that such horrible things happened and what they should do to prevent it from happening. Being politically correct is not the right answer. But having the children experience that sort of violence, which is not just physical, is far more potent. And, and they just destroyed uh, the book. <laughs> you I know, know. and, and it's, it's, it was banned, and it has been banned, obviously. And yeah, I, I mean, that, that is the kind of book it is. Uh, it, uh, Mark Twain said that he, he felt <laughs> that um, people would not like it and would ban it because um, of the fact that uh, Huck, um, uh, you know, frees Jim and, and, and likes Jim. And I don't know if you remember, he also said um, that, please take um, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer away from the library, from the shelves where Bible is, because he said Bible is one of the most violent and obscene books. And then when Tom, uh, when so Tom, becomes, he, when Tom becomes a judge, he, he puts him in the same You know, he, he knew what, what he was doing. <laughs> and, and, and you read um, uh, his protests both in his diaries, in his letters, as well as, um, you know, in his pieces, public pieces that he wrote. I mean, he, he's the one who wrote United States of Lyncherdom, after all, you know. Um, how, could some, how can someone times, who wrote that much, how could he write an autobiography that he said couldn't be published until 100 years after his death? It's, I know, and that shows you how um, we can be much more courageous and brave about confronting the evils in the world than the small flaws in ourselves. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing also that he was very worried because in those times it was very rare that people wrote uh, personal biographies. And I think he was worried about hurting people. He wanted everyone uh, to be I, dead before they... <laughs> Yeah, he wanted to everybody, including himself, be dead. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny because this always leads back. You know, I realize I just had a moment of epiphany, too, because I realize you're not overly optimistic. You're just doing what you're doing the best you can do, which is to try to tell people if they don't listen, they don't listen. But it's better for you to much better for you to do what you've done than not to do anything at all. I just realized that. <laughs> well, all of us are like that. You know, otherwise we might as well be dead. Right. You know, we all do what we can, and, and, and we hope that, you know, it will have some uh, effect or influence. But, you know, I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't done this. <laughs> you know? Well, it's funny because, um, you know, because of the first book and this book in which you also sprinkle him quite generously, you, I'm going to call it an obsession. You can call it whatever you want with Nabokov. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, do you know why I think it's so? Because, why? Because Nabokov, English was a second language to him. And because of that, he wrote with such precision. He had this perspective about English that allowed him to write in such a way that it's almost he's playing a different game than authors and I think you do the same thing in a certain way it's almost well, I a... wish I I was I had his uh, genius but um, I, I do think that uh, he is amazing with language and also Nabokov has um, um, experienced and in his novels has gone deeply into all the different kinds of exile <laughs> and the fact that he uh, celebrates uh, life and celebrates individuals as opposed to a sort of generalized totalitarian culture. Uh, and I appreciate that in him. I remember when uh, but I... But I always said, you know, I said it in reading Lolita, I'm, I'm, I'm very promiscuous when it comes to literature. <laughs> you, know? you know, our conversations... I, love all, I mean, I love Great Gatsby. I can't get over Great Gatsby. I know, so do I. Um, I, I no, I still remember. And so we beat on boats against the current born ceaselessly into the past. I mean, Yeah, there you life. go. <laughs> but you know, it's funny, our conversation sounds just like one of your conversations with your friend who died. Like we're both talking, we're trying to talk over each other, and it's almost like we're <laughs> gossiping, you know. And I love well, that. Well, that is the best kind of conversation, isn't it? Uh, yeah, when you're. That, um, <laughs> I when so. someone says something, you're inspired and you you're enlightened, and you want to say something else. Right back. <laughs> so, I, and you know. I remember when I read uh, Transparent Things, and I had uh -huh. after I finished reading it, I had to sit down and think about how that book had just changed my life. It. 
I had to oh my think, God. I had to think about all the things that had ever happened to me and the places I had been and then the times that laid on top of those places. The places never move. Yeah. The things that happen there move. And it it changed my it changed my life, you know? It's amazing. Yeah, I know. It is it is amazing. It is amazing. And it is amazing that um um he did it and they all do it just with language. Yeah, I know. The way words, um, the way through words, they create these um, uh, experiences for you, which illuminates your real life. <laughs> you know? well, it's, it's funny. One of the ways I can tell if a book is good is because I used, to, I read again when I was twelve or fifteen. I read all of Ayn Rand's books, and uh -huh. I totally disagree with her politics now. I didn't understand them then. But I remember yeah. the names Howard Rourke and Ellsworth Toohey and yeah. Dominic Franco yeah. and then John Galt and Hank Reardon. And I remember those names in my head as if they're people that I actually met. It, mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why I'm just so caught up in this web of words. You know, it's Yeah, words can be both um, uh, very um, illuminating. They can also become very uh, opaque. They do strange things to us. Well, when you talked at the beginning about, I guess it was like a combination, people being a combination of things a little bit. Maybe you didn't say it that way. But when you wrote your section about Babbitt, do you mm -hmm. feel a certain empathy towards him? How do you feel about him as a person? Well, well uh, the inter one of the interesting things about Babbitt uh, was the fact that um, uh, obviously, at least with me, uh, I, I do not like uh, what Babbitt does. And uh, if I had met him in real life, <laughs> we wouldn't get along very well. Uh, but what um, Sinclair Lewis does, which is interesting, is to show that despite the fact that Babbitt is such uh, ultimate um, representative of conformity and everything, he also, deep down in his heart, uh, is, is restless. He also dreams. And I loved the fact that Babbitt feels that he has lost something, that he has never done in life uh, anything that he really wanted to do. And I think that uh, leaves some hope for us. <laughs> you know, the fact that um, everyone in life pays a price. And if you um, will lose money and um, because you're following your passion, Babbitt loses something much more precious, uh, which is the chance of a lifetime to follow his passion. Uh, yeah. So I, 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 I think that people like us would feel much better, you know. <clears throat> he, well, money, you know, the problem is money does mean something for whatever reason. It's, it stands for something just as literature does. But it's, a, yeah. it's somewhat illusory, but it still stands for it. Look what's happened in the stock market in the past four days. There's people that are walking around depressed as they can be. And it all happened for psychological reasons, simply because... Two people got the Ebola virus in the United States. Silly. It's all silly. Yeah, it is really when you go to the, you know, uh, when you investigate it, uh, go beyond the surface, uh, as you say, it is silly. How come, um, you, how come you labeled the first two sections, um, Huck and Babbitt, and then the third one you called Carson instead of the name of the book? Well, because um, in the first two sections, um, who the, the protagonist was far more defined. Uh, you know, I, I, of course, in both Huck and Babbitt, um, the book was even named after them. Uh, but uh, in the other one, we had really um, six characters, uh, each of whom, in their own way, uh, contributed to the overall theme. I mean, I'm not saying that the others in those other books didn't, but um, these characters, for me, they almost became too prominent, each of them. And uh, I felt that maybe uh, in this novel, Carson McCullers, in some way, um, empathized with, with all of them. <laughs> And, and you know what, in each section also, and I always like this, in each section you have really interesting epigraphs at the beginning of each section. Do you come up with those before, during, after you've written those? Uh, it depends. Like, I always, um, I loved um, 
Oscar Wilde's um, uh, and, and it so fit uh, Mark Twain that I didn't think about it even or before even writing I mean Babbitt um, uh, the poem by E. Cummings um, uh, when I was in college the first time I read it uh, it reminded me of uh, E. Cummings's poem uh, so, but um, for um, Carson, it took a while, uh, and um, it was the last one that I found, uh, because I kept um, not being able to find, you know, uh, the one that I really felt was, um, and then uh, for some reason, I don't know why I was reading Shirley Jackson um, and, and um, her, uh, the story that I used to teach in Iran, Lottery. And so uh, I went, um, I, I, I found that quote from her. Yeah, I know. And it's um, like, without imagination, without dreaming. No, yeah, you die. You die. There <laughs> so is no you can't go 24 hours. I thought that is great. And the, but, ba- and uh, the Babbitt one is perfect because it mirrors the book almost perfectly in a lyrical Whim, almost whimsical kind of, but at the same time. Yeah, kind of and um, the, the, the poem, uh, uh, American uh, novels in their own way uh, pay so much attention to recreating a new language for all these new characters. And uh, E. Cummings in that very short poem uh, had created a character, <laughs> you know, uh, just through the guy speaking. Well, it's it's a great. I I really loved your book, and I it's you know. You, Thank it, you. It's it's not but, that you put a gloss on these books, which would be demeaning to say. It's that you really, especially for those who have just read or who want to read those books, and there's a new edition of Huckleberry Finn that comes out soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. It gives them an idea of why these books are so important without giving away what happens, what actually happens in the book. So that's why it's so cool. Well. Um, I'm glad that, um, you know, uh, we had this conversation. Me too. It was this fun. This is the good thing about books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you not find because, people who share yeah. the same thing. Yeah. And we could go on talking yeah. and going into yeah. modern yeah. literature. But I, but anyway, I, 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 took, I took more time than your publicist wanted me to. But um, I just wanted to say again that uh, the book comes out tomorrow. And uh, you'll be reading and signing at the Free Library this Thursday. Uh, at 7.30 p.m. And I'm going to do my best to be there, so maybe I can meet you then as well. Thank you. I would love to meet you. Likewise. Um, Thank you. Okay. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. And if you get a chance, maybe you'll come by the bookstore and do a signing there. I would love to. We just spoke with Azar Nafisi, The Republic of Imagination, America in Three Books, published tomorrow, um, released tomorrow. And then Thursday she'll be at the Free Library. I strongly suggest that you be there. Um, come by our place, get a book, go wherever you want to and get a book and take it down there. And also you can buy them down there as well. I think there's a $15 admission fee, which is well worth it. She's a very sweet lady. And if you go to YouTube, take a look at her interview um, uh, on The Late Show with Seth Meyers. Um, So we have so many people lined up. I really can't say who's next week. But coming up, we have this month and I guess the beginning of next month, Theodore Gray, who's the author of Molecules, which I've spoken about, great, great book. He's he wrote Elements. Both of these are apps for the um, iPhone and the iPad. They're excellent, beautiful. And then Nell Fink, who wrote this book called The Wall Creeper, which is one of the weirdest books I've ever read. It's a little tiny book. You should read it. And then, then Johanna uh, Skibsrud, S K I B S R U D, author of Quartet for the End of Time which is about the actual musical piece, um, but carries that over into the book. And then Asaf Agavron, author of The Hilltop. And then, you know, uh, Rebecca, my producer, is just lining up more and more of them. And since the show has become so popular, at least hopefully here, (laughs) but specifically on the Internet and on iTunes, um, we're getting more and more requests from Penguin, Random House, which I think is actually owned by Penguin, um, uh, Scribner's, a bunch of other publishers who look forward to having their authors inter- uh, be interviewed on the show. So in any event, as always, <coughs> excuse me, as always, thank you so much for listening. It makes a big difference to us and I think to the authors. And we will be here next week with another great one. Mm-hmm.
You've been listening to the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today. 